So welcome to this month's There's More Storytelling event. This is our first one for the spring semester. And as always, we like to begin by recognizing that USD is in the, on the land of the Kumeyaay. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the USD community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony, and we find inspiration from this land. So we recognize this is the land of the Kumeyaay. So welcome to everyone, especially if this is your first There's More live storytelling event. This event is part of a broader storytelling initiative that was created by the Humanity Center, Changemaker Hub, and College of the Arts and Sciences. Every month, myself and I have two student producers, Lily Yates and Amulia Madali, we put on this live event focusing on a different theme or idea. And the idea is to share stories that bring out the raw and meaningful experiences of the human condition. We take the recordings of this event, we produce them, and then we publish them on our There's More podcast. You can find us on iTunes by searching for There's More, or you can uh, go to our website, there'smore.sandiego.edu, if you want to hear even more amazing stories like the ones you will hear today. Today, we're gathering for our first co-sponsored event with Career Development. I want to thank Raven Moniz for all of her work coordinating with us and with alumni. And for the first time, we get to hear stories from alumni storytellers. So I also want to thank our other sponsors, Dean Noel Norton of the College of Arts and Sciences, Lindy Villa, the Humanity Center coordinator, as well as Mike Williams and Juan Carlos Rivas with the, Human the, with the Changemaker Hub. Our theme for this month is unexpected. This theme, like all of our themes, can be interpreted in any way that our storytellers wish. However, when Raven and our team came up with Unexpected, we were thinking in terms of the unexpected paths students and alumni travel as they navigate both their careers and their pursuit of a meaningful life. So we're about to get started, uh, but before we do, I'd like to encourage audience members to have their screens on speaker view instead of gallery view and to mute audio. Also, if storytellers are having any problems with their Wi-Fi, we know that turning off audience me member videos can help us with this. At the same time, we know that it's also nice for storytellers to see audience member reactions to their stories. So you can make a, a good judgment call. If it starts to break up, please um, turn it off. At the conclusion of these stories, we're also going to open up the floor for discussion. So please consider insights, connections, questions you might ask in relationship to the stories that you hear. All right, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Alex Detta. She's a 2019 graduate from our English department. A fun fact about Alex is that she currently has Ray and Kylo Ren's lightsabers on her desk. Her story is called The Right Goodbye. Let's welcome Alex. You can use sign language or emojis. Um, and Alex, you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, The Right Goodbye. When my grandfather, Wadi Detta, died in August, 2019, we were able to enter his memory care home to say goodbye, attend his funeral at our local church and embrace everyone in grief or joyful remembrance. My grandmother, Mary Lynn, his loyal wife of over 60 years, sat next to me during the service. I only left her side to stand behind the lectern and speak my parting words for Papa. During that time, I could have never imagined how many difficult, tragic changes our world would endure in the next year, or that during this global pain, I would also lose my grandma. Because of the pandemic, we couldn't hold a funeral or come together to honor her in the same way we honored my grandfather. We instead shouted our goodbyes from the window outside of that same memory care home. Crouching down behind the screen with a mask covering half my face, I found myself struggling to come up with the words on how grateful I was for her. She spent her entire life nurturing, teaching, and inspiring me and so many others. I didn't have the words for the right goodbye then, so I'd like to take this opportunity to share them now. 
Grandma, looking at your life on paper, it's hard to believe you were really human. The way you faced so many trials, using nothing but your weapons of wit and humor to fight against them, all the while caring for all of us, makes me think you might have been some sort of demigod. You survived breast cancer, World War II, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and being married to a politician. You were an incredible mother to your only son. And even though my dad didn't follow in your footsteps of theater and English, he luckily had me to make up for that. Grandma, you supported me through all of my ever-changing creative interests. You were so supportive, in fact, that the other members of my family had to tell me that I actually wasn't that good at singing, dancing, or piano. I know I only read you a few of my poems and short stories and that you never got to see me perform on main stage. But trust me when I say that you are there with me always. I will never be able to capture the entirety of your light. It was so vast in its reach, so bright in its joy that no words I write or characters I create will ever truly emulate it. I know you and Papa are somewhere peaceful, telling your stories to a stadium of admiring souls. Until I can join you on that stage, I will continue working down here, doing my best to remember all your lessons, your love, and never holding back the words. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Nina McGrade. She's a 2020 alumni, also from the English department, well represented today. Nina's childhood dream was to be a professional cake decorator. However, that's not what she's pursuing at this moment. So she's going to tell us about this new path with her story, Work in Progress. Let's welcome Nina. It's called Work in Progress. When I first took creative writing at USD, our first assignment was simply to write a paper answering the question, why I write. Since I ended up declaring creative writing emphasis and spending another year in Professor Malekian's class, I wrote this piece three different times. When I was asked to tell my story about my experience studying a major in the humanities field, these were the first words I turned to for my inspiration because they have a lot to do with why I'm here. I was working an eight hour shift at my part-time job when the pocket of my apron started buzzing. The notification from my LinkedIn app on my phone was going off, which was strange since I never used it. It was a message from someone at USC asking me if I would be interested in talking at a live storytelling event. Here I was hiding in the rug closet of home goods, praying that my manager wouldn't make me organize the pillows again. In that moment, I absolutely thought I had, I had I was gonna say no to this because I really didn't think I had a story to tell. I'm no crazy success story and I don't work as an editor at some magazine and I'm not a teacher. And I tell everyone who doesn't think I can get a job with my English degree that I want to be a digital marketing consultant even though I don't. In reality, I'm working a minimum wage part-time job so that I can hold on to my dream of creating a life I love doing what I love. For about 10 years of my life, I was convinced I was a math person. At the age of eight, I was placed in accelerated math at my school. I loved numbers and thought that I was just inherently good at math, but eventually I realized that I mistook my hard work for natural intelligence. Up until I took managerial accounting in my second year of college, the only C I ever got was in my third grade writing class. I remember it more vividly than any C I've ever gotten. I was never good at following directions. When I didn't want to read a book for my book report, I ended up completely fabricating an entire story instead of reading the actual book. In high school, the, the online thesaurus became my best friend because I thought that using complicated words would automatically make me sound smarter. I did whatever it took to get me the A. These are the reasons that led me to believe that I was not a writer. For the first 12 years of my education, everyone told me how to write, and I didn't want to listen to any of it. And when I didn't have an my, and when I didn't have an exact three-part thesis laying out every point addressed in a conclusion paragraph that wrapped up my 500-word essay, my paper was covered in red ink. It wasn't until halfway through college, nearly failing accounting, that I realized that I guess I wasn't a math person either. So the question I then asked myself was, what's now? The thought that ultimately led me to wanting to be here today is that I think sharing my journey with humanities is something that I would have wanted to hear when I was grappling with this question of where do I go from here. I didn't feel like I belonged in any major. Sure, I was better in some classes than others, but none of them made me feel like I had a future. This is a feeling I'm sure many students go through when truly each decision they make will affect so much of their future. 
the pressure can cause you to think that a career you are passionate about is completely out of reach. And that's how I felt. And as I was taking more required English classes at USD, I realized that I was actually really enjoying myself and excelling in writing. I felt my perspective continuously changing on so many elements of writing that I spent my whole life learning how to avoid. The choice to become an English major presented its very own set of challenges for me. I used to joke with my dad that I was gonna switch my major to English because in his businessman mindset, it wasn't even an option. English degree equaled no money. It was okay for me to have a hobby, something fun to do on the side while I worked towards something more concrete. But the moment I realized this hobby was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, I knew that I was in for the battle. I always struggled to gain approval from my dad. Being the middle child, I got lost in the push and pull of the family sometimes. At times I enjoy that the focus isn't on me. My older sister is successfully following my dad in his big real estate footsteps. My highly motivated younger brother is going to join the US Navy this year. And here I am trying to explain to my parents that I want to write stories for a living. But can you get a job? Can you make money? This was always the knee jerk reaction. Having struggled with anxiety since I was eight years old, writing has always been my number one coping mechanism. The only thing that I could hold on to to keep me grounded. No one in my family understands what that's like. And that's why they didn't understand why pursuing English was so important to me. I feel like it's the only thing I'm meant to do. The question for me has never been why I write, because I think I always knew it, for, it was for myself. The question is why do you share what you write? I never have... I would never have the courage to share the most vulnerable thoughts if I didn't think that it could touch somebody. Writing is healing, but so is reading. I know because there are words that have stuck with me. When I started my YouTube channel, it was like I hit the jackpot. It gave me a sense of purpose that I'd never felt when I think of my possible career choices. It has been one of the most unexpected turns my life has taken, but an amazing one. I found another place to be vulnerable and another place where my writing could come to life. On my channel, I make videos teaching people how to play guitar. I've also shared my songwriting and my advice. Music is one of the most tangible ways I can see that words help people. And I love that I could give people that through teaching them how to play an instrument. I knew the challenge of pursuing a career in something that is one in a million, yet here I am still trying. When I graduated college in a global pandemic, I was panicked. How was I ever going to prove people wrong now that all of my job prospects were put on hold. Instead, I looked inward and took this as a sign to go for what I really wanted. I've always found the most purpose in life helping people through my writing and now my music. YouTube gave me the chance to help people from all over the world create music for themselves. The way I see each piece of writing I create is the same way that I see my videos. It's the same process. The vulnerability I learned to express in my creative writing is now being expressed in every video that I put on the internet. In the beginning, I joked that my 34 subscribers were truly counting on me, but I never imagined back then that a year later, it would become what it is to me now. In the past year, I learned how to edit, upgrade my equipment, and even put my digital marketing knowledge to use. It was extremely discouraging at times, and still is, when I would work so hard on a video only to get a couple hundred views. They, there were countless times when I questioned if it was even worth it to keep going. But every time I see just one comment telling me that I helped someone learn to play their favorite Taylor Swift song or that I inspired them to pick up the guitar again, I know that I'm going in the right direction. When I look back at the choices that led me to my English degree, I'm proud that I was able to take that so-called risk, make the unexpected choice. Gradually, my dad has seen how hard I've worked on my channel and is beginning to see that I will do anything in my power to succeed. Now I'll overhear my own voice coming from his computer, even though I know he has no plans of learning guitar. When I think of the fears I had about trying to find a future career with my English degree, they motivate me to make my goals a reality. Those fears are far less scary than the fear I had of staying on the secure path to a nine to five desk job where I would not be fulfilling my true purpose. Often you hear the myth that when you graduate college, you're supposed to have it all figured out a good paying full-time job offer right out of the gates. And it was hard to see some of my closest friends have these amazing jobs lined up, knowing their passion and getting it to get their masters in that. And it's hard knowing that if I stayed on that path I was going, I could have been right there too, but here I am instead. But what if this is actual the, no 
actually the normal path of a college student, more specifically a humanities major. I think there's more people in my situation than we are led to believe. There are about 13,000 people that watch my videos every week now. That's more than it was four months ago. And that's more than it was more four months before that. I'm definitely not where I want to be yet and YouTube does not pay the bills, but I'm a work in progress. I'm still working to achieve the goals I've set for myself. And I'm not here to say that it's been easy, but I will say that it's been worth it. Every doubt and every failure because I may be spending half my week organizing pots and pans, but I love that I get to spend the other half creating a future that I'm passionate about. All right, our final storyteller is a junior here at USD, majoring in philosophy and interdisciplinary humanities, Thomas Sandbeg. He started a band last week and he's convinced they're gonna make it big, but his story is not about the band, but rather something more spiritual. Please welcome Thomas as he shares with us all the way home. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Keeling. And then also just like to say thanks to the Humanity Center and Changemaker Hub for uh, putting this event on. Um, but uh, to begin here, I'd like to acknowledge upfront that my story revolves around one of the most highly contentious topics of the, well, <laughs> last 2021 years. That it that is it deals with matters of faith, um, in particular particularly Christianity and my own journey with it. However, is merely a part to the whole of humanity. At that, a 21 year old part to the whole. I do not intend to make claims about the reality or unreality of religion. Rather, I only wish to share my own experience with it, an experience that may or may not contribute to yours. I am not prescribing moral advice, and instead may be striving to draw us out of our own moral convictions, to look at them critically and question how certain we can be of what is uncertain. I have no intention of telling you what to do when you leave this place of uncertainty, but merely wish to bring you along to it, if you'll allow me. This journey begins in Colorado Springs, Colorado, the place of my birth. About an hour south of Denver, my family lived on a few acres within the Black Forest, a forest that doesn't actually refer to a forest, but an unincorporated area. Though at the age of seven, it seemed about as real as any forest. Its arcing pine trees were tall enough to block the view in any given direction, providing a sense of seclusion, but slender enough to grant the passage of an adolescent. Many of my childhood afternoons were spent delving into these woods, venturing out in a different direction until I reached an area that had hitherto been unexplored. It was here in this place that I made a home. It was in the unknown that I found a love for getting lost. At the age of eight, following a job offer in the Pacific Northwest, my family decided to up and out and head to the state of Washington. I still remember us pulling out of our driveway for the last time in our old Chevrolet Tahoe, the sky glistening blue as twilight descended, the kind of blue that you'll never find mile high. My family's westward expansion landed us in the suburbs outside of Seattle, quite the shift from the black forest of Colorado Springs. The mountains were still a drive away, the ones closest to us culminated at a mere 4,000 feet. It would take some time for me to acquaint myself with them. But however, gradually, I began to reintroduce myself to the outdoors, though this version was very different from the one I'd known in Colorado. Instead of evenly distributed pines with nothing but needles on the ground between, the forest floors of Washington were matted down with overgrowth, making for a, lands for, for a landscape that even a now 17-year-old struggled to navigate. The forest of Washington came to reflect the discord of my own coming of age. My parents having filed for a divorce and myself drifting from what friends I'd had. With no sky in sight, the forest canopy bearing down upon me, I started to question if there was a way out. Trampling through this kind of growth, it's no wonder that I found the desert floor of Southern California so appealing. I still remember the first time I glimpsed California desert. It was during my freshman year of college when I began to venture east from San Diego. It wasn't until March of that year, though, that I crested the last ridge line of the peninsular mountain ranges to see the desert expand before me. I was ecstatic, for there was no getting lost here, where the only thing limiting your sight line was the curvature of the earth. It was as though, through my time in Washington, I'd lost myself out of a desire to be lost. I'd always been inclined to ask questions, but I was tired of waiting for the answers. The same disposition that Colorado had so carefully cultivated in me, the propensity towards uncertainty was gone. 
Hence, my turning to the clarity provided by the desert and religion. When talking to a classmate about what it was I found so captivating about the desert, I explained there's something so beautiful in the desolation. When there's nothing, we're reminded that there is still something. When we hit rock bottom, the only way to turn is up. And so I did. From the unobstructed view of the desert floor, I turned to the sky to put my faith in the man above. Within my first week at USD, I'd been brought to math by a friend, but it wasn't until the start of my sophomore year that I really committed to the Catholic faith. I found the intellectual tradition of the faith fascinating and the conversations I had with my roommates reflected this, helping us both grow in our understanding of our faith. I think the thing that both of us failed to realize though was that no matter how much you try to rationalize a faith, you can't reason your way into believing anything. We are not rational creatures, but emotional ones. As such, my first crisis of faith was heavily intuition-based. I didn't know why I felt the way I did, but I knew that I felt a way. And it wasn't good. Having been drawn to philosophy through my stint with faith, I found myself in an ethics course by the spring semester of my sophomore year. It was in this course that I was first exposed to the work of Friedrich Nietzsche. I, I laugh because Nietzsche is one of the most infamous critics of religion. And I think it's probably a cliche to say that he turned me into an atheist. And it was just a matter of time until what that truly meant would set in. As I headed back home to Washington at the onset of the pandemic, I was right back in the thick of the brush, both physically in space as I returned to the outdoors of the Pacific Northwest and intellectually, no sky or heaven above to inspire the answers to my questions. In fact, it seemed that shut off as I was from this light, I no longer even needed to ask questions. I had it all figured out and the answer was, answer was that there is no answer. Existence is absurd. It was from this place that I approached a class this past fall, a class on Nietzsche and nihilism, or the belief in no intrinsic value. Through this class, I actually came to quite like the idea of an existence without God, pushing myself to smile in the face of all the freedom that comes of life without God. Even if I'd accepted that the world may never be so orderly, I felt that I'd at least return to this one. But as a theology class made clear this past intercession, the question of whether or not atheism truly had brought me back to this world remained. It seemed that just as religion provided me with answers to my questions, so too did atheism. A negating answer is nonetheless an answer. That there is no answer or that existence is absurd is able to explain a sequence of events in the same way an appeal to God's plan can, both hinging on their diagnoses of our metaphysical existence and both dependent upon conclusions that come from a place far beyond our physical existence on earth. In other words, I came to realize that believing in no God is just as much a faith as believing in a God. Dr. Monhe's class, The Problems of God, revealed to me the problems of believing in no God. Atheism had landed me right back in the heavens, a place of faith, frowning down on the world below me, the world that I had yet to return to. This presented a conundrum of sorts. If I don't deny the existence of God, does that mean I believe in God? To reinstate our metaphor of place, if I don't remain in Washington where the heavens do not exist, shrouded as they are by the dense growth of the forest, does that mean I return to the desert where all anyone can see is the sky above? Not necessarily, for somewhere in between there exists Colorado where the sky can be glimpsed between the trees overhead, but the horizon lingers out of sight from within the black forest. Though the heavens can inspire awe and wonder, they refrain, from, they refrain from providing any kind of navigational compass for us here on Earth. This position is known as agnosticism, which maintains that it cannot be known whether or not God exists. This may seem like a cop-out of sorts. Am I really not going to take a stance on the issue at hand? Does God exist or does God not exist? I won't say, <laughs> not because I don't have a desire to know the truth, but because I think that continuing, continuing to expect an answer to this question would be missing the point. The fact remains that regardless of how much I wish to know, the truth of the matter is beyond us. So why would I even pretend to have an answer to it? Instead of clinging to the certainty of an answer, I learned to sit comfortably with the uncertainty of a question. When I think back on what drove me to religion, to atheism, in the first place, it was the seeking of answers. Answers that I was adamant were out there. But if I consider what I could have avoided had I not been so certain of anything, had I been content to let my questions linger, I would never have surrendered what my home had instilled in me. Not just my home in Colorado, but my home on this earth. 
Life on this planet is a fascinating thing. You're thrown into existence without any kind of choice in the matter. As such, we're bound to ask questions like, am I here for a reason? We're bound to ask questions that do not get answers. We were all born to wander, to love getting lost. The same disposition that my childhood in the Black Forest had inspired in me. Gary, Paul, and the Bond on a trip to the Grand Canyon realized how much time adults spend scanning the landscape for picturesque panoramas and scenic overlooks while the kids were on their hands and knees engaged with what was immediately before them. When I was a child running through the backwoods of Colorado, I didn't care about the questions that weren't available to me. I was preoccupied with navigating the forest that was present to me. I was, quote, engaged with what was immediately before me. The world around me, the people around me filled me with such wonder that I didn't have a need to wonder at the existence of God. And this, I conjecture, is what made that blue sky of Colorado so special. As close to the heavens as I was, I was still so far away. There was a distance between what was out there and what was here. And I didn't have any kind of a desire to close the distance between. Rebecca Solnit writes, the color of that distance is the color of an emotion, the color of there seen from here, the color of where you are not, and the color of where you can never go. For the blue is not in the place those miles away at the horizon, but an atmospheric distance between you and the horizon. Heaven is not so learned because it's a land where promises come true, but because the certainty it provides is so far from us. This is to say that uncertainty colors our own existence. Distance between a question and its answer is what makes the space in between so beautiful. I've come to embrace this expanse, respecting the distance between here and there. And through my welcoming of our experience on earth, I've seen color flow back into my world. I've caught a glimmer of that same blue that you'll never find mile high.